أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم صلى الله عليك يا رسول الله صلى الله عليك يا سيدي ويا مولاي يا أبا عبد الله صلى الله عليك يا سيدي يا أمير المؤمنين يا رحمة الله الواسعة ويا باب نجاة الأمة ويا عبرة كل مؤمن ومؤمنة يا ليتنا كنا معكم فنفوز فوزا عظيما قال الله تعالى في كتابه الكريم وضرب الله مثلا قرية كانت آمنة مطمئنة يأتيها رزقها رغدا من كل مكان فكفرت بأنعم الله فأذاقها الله لباس الجوع والخوف والخوف بما كانوا يصنعون صلوا على محمد وآل محمد Last night we began a discussion on Imam Ali's take on the economy and his view of poverty. And we said perhaps we may learn a lesson or two from Amir al-Mu'mineen for today's economic crisis and our economic and financial problems today, inshallah. And so we continue in this journey. Amir al-Mu'mineen teaches us how to treat the poor, someone who has less than us, someone who is not as as financially blessed as us. How do we deal with the poor? This is very important. This is a very sensitive topic because in every community, there is the lower class and the middle class and the upper class, and they mix in the same community centers and the same mosques. However, Sometimes the upper class can be very insensitive to those in the lower class. They don't treat them properly. They're insensitive to their needs, to their insecurities, to their emotions and their feelings. Amir al-Mu'mineen tells us how the rich should behave around the poor. Number one, don't show off. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given you an abundance of wealth Enjoy it, make use of it. But when you're around the poor, be sensitive. Be sensitive to their emotions. Be sensitive, if not to the fa- to the adults, to the father and the mother, their children. Their children, their children don't understand. They don't see why, for example, they have to eat differently as other families or dress differently or live in a different house or in a different car. Amir al-Mu'mineen says, be sensitive. Irham al-fuqara liqillati sabrihim. Have mercy with the poor for their lack of patience. Don't show off in front of them, flashing your expensive car, expensive watch, expensive phones, clothing, shoes. There's some people that can't afford. If you know that you're going to somewhere, to a place where there's other mu'mineen that can't afford what you have, they can't afford the clothing or the car or the watch, that you afford, be sensitive to them. Be sensitive to them because you're adding to their burden, to the burden of not being able to afford what you afford. You're adding to that 
burden. Amir al-Mu'minin says, مَا أَحْسَنُوا تَوَاضُعْ الْأَغْنِيَاءِ لِلْفُقَرَاءِ طَلَبًا لِمَا عِنْدَ اللَّهِ What is greater than the humility and humbleness of the rich towards the poor? Sit with them. Eat with them. Live with them. Show them sympathy. Be sensitive to their needs. This is the greatest form of humility and humbleness. Also, we are taught to give before we're asked. Unfortunately, unfortunately, and many times we don't give, we don't donate, we don't give charity, we don't give donations unless we asked, unless we're asked. The Imam tells us be in the habit of giving before being asked, before someone poor, before the needy, before the destitute or those who have less than us, before they ask us, let's offer them. That way we will save them the agony and the trouble and the embarrassment of asking. This is great in the eyes of Allah, that you give before you're asked. When we're asked, sometimes we give out of embarrassment, out of shame, because I'm embarrassed now, they're embarrassing me, now I have to give. I'm shy, I'm embarrassed, I'm put on the spot, I give. It's not the same when I give without being asked. Amir al-Mu'mineen says, as True generosity, true generosity comes when you give without being asked. When you give after being asked, this is no longer generosity. This is called embarrassment. Now you're embarrassed. Now you have to give. Now you just have to give. Now that you're asked, you're embarrassed. You can't say no. It's not out of generosity. Generosity is when you Give initially, you take the initiative without having to be asked, whether it's for the masjid, for the school, or someone poor, someone needy. And then Amir al teaches us that the rich have to feel responsibility for the poor. Don't say this is an independent family. I don't care. This person should work. This person should go out and make a living and I'm not a responsible. You are responsible. We are responsible. The rich are responsible for the poor. Inna Allah farada fi amwal al-aghniya aqwat al-fuqara. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has put the livelihood of the poor and the wealth of the rich. Don't think that you are no longer responsible. You are responsible. You're not just responsible for your immediate family members and your relatives. You're responsible for the poor in the community. فَمَا جَاءَ فَقِيرٌ إِلَّا بِمَا مُتَّعَ بِهِ غَنِي When you see someone going hungry, know that it is the rich who are not giving him. They're taking his money. They're taking his wealth. Let's give. Let's offer. Let's, let's offer the less needy. Let's have that sense of responsibility. The idea, the notion of saying, I don't care. Let this person work. I'm not responsible. No, you are responsible. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, take from what you have and give to the needy. Make them rich like you. And they will be rich just like you. They will build their money. They will build from scratch. They will build the same way that you built yourself. Give them the opportunity to build themselves as well. Wallahu sa'iluhum an dalik. And Allah will, will ask and hold the rich accountable that you saw the poor in your community. You saw some that were not so well to do in your community, but you did not help them. You did not ask about them, and you did not support them. طيب, صلوا على محمد وعلى محمد. In the political, economic philosophy of Amir al-Mu'mineen, and as I mentioned yesterday, Amir al-Mu'mineen has a treatise that has to be read and examined, not just on community levels, even on academic levels. This amazing treatise by Amir al muminin that shows his political philosophy, his economic philosophy, how to run a government. Unfortunately, it's not studied. Here in the West, they're obsessed with Machiavelli's The Prince, which is a, a book teaching people how to become dictators. But they're obsessed with Machiavelli's The Prince. Amir al muminin has this beautiful, amazing treatise on how to rule, 
and how to be the opposite of a dictator, the complete opposite of the message of the prince by Machiavelli. No, how to be an accepted leader, a leader that people will respect and love and benefit from. Unfortunately, it is understudied. It is understudied. And as I mentioned perhaps yesterday or that's before, that this treatise deserves PhD dissertations, that we study and examine and analyze this treatise. I mean, what mean speaks of the government's responsibility when it comes to the economy, when it comes to eradicating poverty. And this is something that we can learn from today. The government's job and responsibility in eradicating poverty and making sure that there's financial prosperity for all to enjoy. So a part of it is monitoring the market. The government has to monitor the market. From what? From preventing monopolies happening. Monopoly can destroy an economic system. It can destroy governments by having a group of people have a monopoly over a certain product, over anything, and being able to control the prices. In Islam, this is forbidden. Al-Ihtikar, which, which is monopoly, is one of the greatest sins. You cannot have a monopoly over sugar, for example, or water, or certain food supplies, or even, even over the internet, or phone lines. No, because when you have a monopoly over a certain product, you will control the prices. You will control the market. And that's where corruption can come in. The government's job is to monitor the market, make sure there's no monopoly, and control the prices so that prices don't hike all of a sudden and people are not able to buy and sell gas prices, for example. We see all of a sudden gas prices hike. They hike up. They spike. And people can't afford these prices. It is the government's job to make sure that there's no spike in in certain prices all of a sudden. Amir Mu'mineen says to Malik al-Ashtar, فَمْنَعْ مِنَ الْإِحْتِكَارِ Forbid monopolies. فَإِنَّ رَسُولَ اللَّهِ مَنَعْ مِنْهُ Rasulullah Allah would make sure that there's no monopoly. You see Rasulullah, we tend to see him only as a spiritual guide and a spiritual leader. No, Rasulullah was a political leader. He made sure that there was no monopoly. Monopoly has nothing to do with spirituality. But it's a political issue. It's an economic issue. Rasulullah made sure that there was no monopoly. وَلْيَكُنِ الْبَيْعُ بَيْعًا سَمِحًا بِمَوَازِينَ عَدْلٍ وَأَسْعَارٍ لَا تُجْحِفْ بِالْفَرِيقَيْنِ مِنَ الْبَائِعِ وَالْمُبْتَعِ And make sure the government, Amir al-Mu'mineen is telling his governor in Egypt, that make sure prices are accommodating. Prices of com commodities, products, they are reasonable prices. Make sure that in the market there are no crazy prices where people cannot afford products that they need. And also we see that Amir al-Mu'mineen alayhi salam in his Ahd to Malik al-Ashtar in his treatise, he tells him that make allow people to make use of lands. There's vast lands in every country and every place. There's vast lands. Let people own lands. Today, what is the percentage of people who are homeowners that own homes and property? Not many. Maybe half of the people don't own homes and they live off of rent. They rent. While in Islam, we believe that every person should be a homeowner. Every person should be a landowner. Why? Because land is for Allah. And anyone who comes and builds upon this land, you find a piece of land. Of course, this is a Please don't do this here in British Columbia and get me in trouble. This is a theoretic discussion. In Islam, this is a theoretic discussion that p pieces of land are not owned by the government. Government does not own land. The people own the land. You can go out, find a hundred, two meters, as long as it fulfills your need and it's not something too extravagant, go and build upon that land. Go and plant, perform, have agriculture, it becomes yours. You don't need to pay to the government. You don't need to pay rent. This way, Islam makes everyone a landowner. Everyone becomes a homeowner. And you don't need to pay off rent. This is a juristic principle in the fiqhi school of thought.
Amir al-Mu'mineen, in his political, economic philosophy, he also discusses preventing poverty. Sometimes there's poverty and we need to fix it. We need to bring a solution to poverty. Sometimes we can prevent poverty from happening from day one. How? For example, paying sadaqah. Paying sadaqah. Paying sadaqah prevents poverty? Yes. Yes. Amir al Mu'minin says, Istanzulu rizqa bil sadaqah. Give sadaqah and you will never go poor. Now, there's two ways to look at this. There is a ghaybi, unseen sort of way to say that, you know, the sadaqah that you give, it will have blessings upon you and you will never go poor. And then there's a sociological way of studying the case. When you give sadaqah, and I give sadaqah, and everyone here is give sadaqah to the poor. Will there be poverty? The poor will have money. But how will I benefit? I will benefit as well. If I'm a shop owner, if I'm a small business owner, and I give sadaqah every day to the less fortunate, to the, to the needy, and I give them money, they'll be able to buy. When they buy, I benefit. And the market moves. There'll be action in the, in the market. Everyone will have the ability to buy and sell by offering, offering them sadaqah. When we give sadaqah, people will have the ability to buy and sell, and that in itself will improve the economy and everyone benefits, including myself, who originally gave the sadaqah, I will benefit myself. Also, the Imam teaches us to respect amana and trust. al amana tajurru rizq to be able to trust someone and you respecting the trust. Any economy, for economy to flourish, there has to be trust in the economy. How can you buy and sell without trusting? If you wish to deceive the trust, then this will, not, not only will it destroy you and people's trust in you, but it will destroy the economy. The economy requires trust to be able to buy and sell, to be able to take, a, take out a loan, to be able to take a mortgage, to be able to use a credit card and pay later, or to buy now, pay later. This all builds on trust. This is what any sustainable economy needs. It's built on trust. If there's no trust in an economy, this economy will not flourish. And hence, al-amana tajurru rizq that respecting a trust will bring you sustenance. Breaking the trust will bring you poverty. Also, one of the ways of prevention, preventing poverty from happening is avoiding sins. Avoiding sins. Amir al-Mumineen says, مَا ضَرَبَ اللَّهُ الْعِبَادَ بِصَوْطٍ مِنَ الْفَقْرِ Allah does not punish His servants with a punishment more severe than poverty. More severe than poverty. And also there's two ways of looking at it. One way is that sins take out the blessings from our money, from our wealth. They take out the blessing. This is one way. Looking at it from a ghaybi, unseen sort of way. Or there's a sociological way of studying the case. Sins are costly. Alcohol, drugs, Gambling, these things are costly. They destroy an economy. Alhamdulillah, we are, none of us have this disease. Many don't have this disease. Those who drink alcohol, do you know how much they spend on alcohol? How, those who have the problem of drugs, do you know how much they spend on drugs? This causes them to go broke. This causes them to go into poverty. Those who are addicted to gambling, it makes them go broke and they lose all of their money for these sins. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says that these sins are costly. Amir al tells us to avoid such sins because they get us into poverty. Also, this is something that Amir al also stressed upon, spending economically. Spending economically. Amir al says, وَمَلْبَسُهُمُ الْاِقْتَصَادِ When he describes the muttaqeen, the pious, he says, they dress economically. Dress nice, dress fancy, but it doesn't have to be the most expensive shirt. 
It doesn't have to be the most expensive dress when you can't pay your rent or when you're paying off mortgage. Yeah, you have to keep a balance. ما عال من اقتص من اقتصد أمير المؤمنين says he who spends economically will not go broke will not become poor let me give a couple of examples and this is a lesson for our youth for our young brothers and sisters who wish to get married but complain that they cannot afford it well of course you can't afford it when you're spending your money on useless things and you're not saving up to get married obviously you're not gonna you're not going to afford it. Let me give you an example. If you need a $40,000 car, if there's such a thing as a $40,000 car, if you need a $40,000 car, do not buy a $60,000 car. That's going to waste. You won't be spending economically. If you need a $30 shirt, don't buy a $60 dress. You don't need to have a $30 meal every night or every weekend. You don't need that Apple Watch. There's a lot of things that we buy and we save up and we don't even use. Or we could do away. We could do without. This is a lesson for our youth, for the young brothers and sisters. And you live in a very expensive country. And in fact, you live in a very expensive city, a, a tourist attraction where everything's expensive. Save up. Amir al Mumineen says, Ma alam al Save up your money. You don't have to buy things that you don't need. There are some youth, they go and sign up at a gym for $350, $400 uh, a year monthly subscription. Why? Go out and jogging. You can work out in your gym. Save up that money. This is important to save, to spend economically. And also planned parenthood. This is also something that Amir al-Mu'mineen alayhi salam taught his followers. He says, Having less children is economically an advantage for you. If you're broke, you don't need to have 13 children, my dear brothers and sisters. Raising children more than you can handle and of course, this, there is the responsibility of raising them, parenting them Islamically. It's not about quantity. Yes, Islam says have more children if you can raise them properly, if you can parent them in an Islamic way. What good is it if you have 15 children, but they're lost? And they have nothing to do with Islam. <laughs> Having less children means less of a financial burden upon you صلى على محمد وعلى محمد أمير المؤمنين عليه السلام also discussed creating wealth now that you want to create wealth you'd like to become a businessman a successful businessman and yes Islam teaches us this don't think that Islam is all about tahara and salah and fasting and hajj and khums no Islam is a religion of akhirah and a religion of dunya. It came to fix both of our worlds, both of our lives, dunya and akhirah. I read this verse a couple of nights ago. Work to receive the satisfaction of your Lord, build your akhirah, but at the same time, don't forget about your dunya. Atina fi dunya hasana wa fil akhirati hasana. A mu'min keeps a balance between both, both lives, both worlds, dunya and akhirah. Don't think that living a simple life and not worrying about this dunya is going to get you a better place in akhirah. Work for both. Work for both. طيب. So Amir al-Mu'mineen says there's several ways of building an abundance of wealth. Number one, seeking the right knowledge. You see, my dear friends, seeking knowledge in Islam is highly recommended. Rather, it is mandatory. However, seeking the right knowledge. There are some that go and seek the wrong type of knowledge. Knowledge that doesn't benefit them. Not for their akhirah and not for their dunya. 
getting a degree, for example, in dinosaurs. Where is that going to get you? What job are you going to get with a PhD in dinosaurs, for example? Or some weird, unbeneficial sort of field that won't get you anywhere. You won't find the right job. No one will hire you. And you'll be left with a strong degree and, a, and lots of debts to pay to your university. And you haven't, you haven't gone anywhere. Amir al-Mu'minin says, تَعَلَّمُ الْعِلْمِ فَإِنَّهُ زَيْنٌ لِلْغَنِي وَعَوْنٌ لِلْفَقِيرِ Seek knowledge. Knowledge for the rich, it's ornament, it's decoration, it's, it's something to be proud of. But for the poor, it's a way of be, becoming rich. For the poor, it's one way of becoming rich by seeking the appropriate knowledge, by equipping yourself with the right knowledge, with the right education. Because not getting the right education will cause unemployment. I know a lot of you, they went into a certain field and then they ended up not getting a job because they did not choose wisely. They did not choose the right degree and going into the right major. When choosing your major, make sure that you go into a major where you will be on high demand. As soon as you graduate, companies will come after you and would like to hire you. Choose the right knowledge and right education. Don't be spontaneous. To gain experience. Gaining experience. Gaining experience is priceless. Even if it's at the cost of losing money. Sometimes you lose money. You had a business opportunity. You had a project and it didn't work out. You lost money, but you gained experience. You gained experience. That is priceless. Don't think that this was a failed attempt, failed project, but you gained. Amir al muminin says, Lam yadhab min malika ma wa'adak. Some people, they start a business advent adventure. They opened a small shop. It didn't work out. They opened another shop. It didn't work out. But you gained experience. Don't say, I lost my money. Yes, you lost money, but you gained experience. And that is priceless. There is no university, there is no college that teaches you experience. Experience is gained by human experiences. You have, to, you have to perform, you have to work, you have to achieve, and you'll gain experience. And that is priceless. That is priceless. Amir al-Mu'mineen also says that sit with those who have experience. Those who built a business. Those who had a successful project, those who succeeded, sit with them, benefit from them, learn from them. He says, عَلَيْكَ بِمُجَالَسَةِ أَصْحَابِ التَّجَارِبِ فَإِنَّهَا تُقَوَّمْ عَلَيْهِمْ بَأَغْلَى الْغَلَاءِ Gaining experience from those who are experienced, this is also priceless. Experience itself is capital to gain experience. Also, Amir al teaches us to plan and to plan ahead. Of course, know that we plan and Allah Azza wa Jal is the ultimate planner. And sometimes our plans don't go as we planned. But it doesn't mean that we become spontaneous and we go with the flow. I wake up in the morning and I see what's on the top of my head and I start a project based on that. No, there has to be planning. I do my homework. I do my research. I have to see what is on the job market. What what makes a successful business? What is needed in my city, in my town, in my country? What makes a successful project? Amir al-Mu'mineen says, la mala liman la tadbira la. He who does not have planning has no money. We've seen a lot of people, they have wealth, they have a lot of money, but they wasted it because they did not plan. They did not do their research. Amir al-Mu'mineen says, la aqlaka tadbir. There is no brain there is no logic like planning so don't plan so don't plan ahead that this is my goal these are my business advent adventures for the next year two years three years also take advantage of opportunities there's a good business deal prices went down check the stock market be always on the lookout for opportunities amir al-mu'mineen says al-fursa tamarru marra sahab Opportunities come like clouds on a summer day. They come quickly and they pass by quickly. Be on the lookout for good opportunities. You never know. 
take advantage of certain events. There's an event happening, maybe you could take advantage of it and make a good business deal. Also, to have good akhlaq. Having good akhlaq will not only bring you reward in akhirah, but you will, re- you will be rewarded in dunya. How? Salla ala Muhammad wa ala Muhammad. Amir al-Mu'mineen alayhi salam says, Fi sa'at al-akhlaqi kunuzu al-arzaq. Treasures of wealth can come to you by having good akhlaq. Great akhlaq. Indeed. Indeed. Go to a country where customer satisfaction is above all, above all else and that country is beautiful, you'll want to go again and again and again. You will see it becomes a, a major tourist attraction. Why? Because the people there, they make you feel comfortable. You feel good about yourself. Go to another country and I'm sure you've experienced this and I've experienced this. There are some countries, they're very beautiful. They're very beautiful. The restaurants, they have the best food, they have the best hotels, but people have the worst akhlaq. You will say, I'll never go to this country again. This is my last time. People, business partners, if, if you have a business partner that has no akhlaq, you will say, I'll never deal with this person again. That is why here in the West, customer satisfaction is above all else. Customer satisfaction. Unfortunately, go back home to our countries. Is there anything called customer satisfaction? That is why they fail. They fail in every project that they do, not just in business. Everything that they do is a failure because there's no such thing called customer satisfaction. Amir al Mu'minin says, Man sa'a khuluquh, dhaqa rizquh. He who has bad akhlaq, his rizq will also be terrible. There's a correlation between your akhlaq and your rizq. Tayyip, perfecting the job. When you do a job, perfect it. Amir al Mu'minin says, Rahim Allah, abdan, amala, amalan, amala, amalan, fa'atqana. May Allah have mercy upon a, an individual who performs a job and perfects the job. Perfects the job. What is it that you plan on doing? What is your business about? Whatever it is. For example, you fix carpets in people's home. Make sure that is the best carpet that you do. You paint people's home. Make sure that is the best paint. That will bring you business. That will make you the most successful person in your field. This is what the Imam teaches us. That you'd like to live comfortably and make an abundance of wealth, make sure that you perfect your job. Have you seen certain products that come from certain countries? They break the next day or after a week. They don't perfect the job. Their products are weak and hence their economy might collapse. Make sure that we perfect, we have to perfect the job. Also, having a business partner. Amir al Mumineen alayhi salam, he tells us, that if you are thinking of a business adventure, have a partner. Don't do it by yourself. Go with someone else who is well to do in your community and has a strong business. Go and tell them that I'd like to become your partner. Amir al Mu'mineen says, Shariku al ladina aqbala alayhum al rizq, fa ennuhu akhlaqu lil ghina wa ajdaru bi iqbali al hawdi alayh. Go and see who is well to do, who is doing good in their business. Tell them, I'd like to become your partner. Tell me what I have to do to become your partner. Do adventures together, business adventures together. Don't start off on your own. Don't start a major project on your own. You might lose, you might fail, you might not succeed. Have business partners. You know, there's a, an African proverb. They say, if you want to walk fast, walk alone. If you want to walk far, Walk together, walk together. If you want to have a lasting, strong business project, do it with someone else. And finally, and finally, Amir al-Mu'mineen teaches us that if you're not doing so well in this city, in this country, you've tried time and time again, migrate. Migrate to somewhere else. Migrate to another land. Migrate to another city. Migrate to another town and perhaps you will succeed in that other town. It didn't work here, it will work somewhere else. Allah says, وَمَنْ يُهَاجِرْ فِي سَبِيلِ اللَّهِ يَجِدْ فِي الْأَرْضِ مُرَاغَمًا كَثِيرًا وَسَعَةً 
He who migrates for the sake of Allah will find an abundance. They will find ease, political ease, economic ease, social ease. And Amir al Mu'mineen says, خَيْرُ الْبِلَادِ مَا حَمَلَكْ لَا مَا حَمَلَكْ The best of lands is a land that tolerates you, not a land that burdens you. And he also says, الْغِنَى فِي الْغُرْبَةِ وَطَنِ وَالْفَقْرُ فِي الْوَطَنِ غُرْبَةِ being rich, but being far away from home. That is your land, that is home. Although you're, not a, you're far away from home, but you live economically well, that becomes your home for you. But being poor in your home, that is ghurba, that is loneliness. It's not about where you live, it's about where you can achieve and produce the most. Now let's come to the house of Amir al-Mu'mineen on the eve of the 20th of the holy month of Ramadan. Amir al-Mu'mineen salam is on his bed, surrounded by his sons and daughters and children and companions wanting to come and visit. Al-Imam al-Hassan had stood outside, preventing people from coming in. Let's go back the night before. We ended with the strike on the head of Amir al-Mu'mineen alayhi salam. And Amir al-Mu'mineen falls and he shouts, Fustu wa Rabbil Ka'bah. Amir al-Mu'mineen was drenched in his blood. Yet, he still wanted to get up and pray Salat al-Fajr. And Imam al-Hassan prevents him. He tells him, no, my master, you don't have the ability to. So Imam al-Hassan leads Salat al-Fajr on the 19th of Ramadan and the Mu'mineen pray behind him and then they carry Amir al-Mu'mineen to his house as they carry him from Masjid al-Kufa to the house of Amir al-Mu'mineen for those of you that have been there the house of Amir al-Mu'mineen is very close to the Masjid when they were carrying him Amir al-Mu'mineen had to be carried to his house when they were about to arrive to the house Amir al-Mu'mineen said put me put me on the ground let me walk they told him why Ya Amir al-Mu'mineen, you can't walk. He said, let me walk. I don't want to be carried inside. Why? He said, I don't want Zainab to, be, to see me being carried. She will be shocked. She will be upset. I don't want Zainab to see me being carried. Let her see me walking on my feet inside the house. Amir al-Mu'mineen comes inside. On a night like this, Al-Asbagh ibn Nubata, he said, I came to visit my master, Amir al-Mu'mineen alayhi salam, and I saw him wearing a yellow turban on his head to cover the injury. And I don't know which one was more yellow and pale, his face or his turban. He said, I sat next to him, and Amir al-Mu'mineen, every couple of minutes he would faint and come back to consciousness I started crying and weeping for Amir al-Mu'mineen alayhi salam. Amir al-Mu'mineen opened his eyes and he, said, and he said, Why are you crying, ya asbar? What brings, your, what brings your tears to your eyes? He said, Ya Amir al-Mu'mineen, I cry. He said, Why are you crying? For Allah, inna hal jannah. I am going towards heaven. I am going towards paradise. Why are you crying? He said, Ya Amir al-Mu'mineen, I cry for your loss. We're about to lose you, Ya Amir al-Mu'mineen. You're about to depart us, Ya Amir al-Mu'mineen. I cry for ourselves and the loss that we will have to endure after you leave. It was on a night like this that a doctor comes to visit Amir al-Mu'mineen. He comes and he performs an experiment to see how far the poison had reached the head of Amir al-Mu'mineen. The doctor tells Amir al-Mu'mineen, after investigating and seeing where the poison had reached, the doctor tells Amir al-Mu'mineen, Ya Amir al-Mu'mineen, a'hid ahdak wa awsi wasiyyatak, fa inna adu wallah qad balagat darbatuhu umma ra'sik. The enemy of Allah has reached 
your brain, Ya Amir al muminin this is where the poison has reached. Say your final words, say your final, your final will. The doctor also prescribes for Amir al muminin to drink milk because milk would reduce the pain of the poison. News reaches the city moments later, hours later, Several orphans gathered, a bunch of orphans, a group of orphans gathered at the door of Amir al-Mu'mineen, all of them carrying milk with them, saying, this is for our father Ali ibn Abi Talib. One of the children, one of the orphans, after they took the milk from him, he said, you took our milk, now give us our father Ali ibn Abi Talib. Amir al-Mu'mineen drinks from the milk, and then he says, خُذُوهُ لِأَسِيرِكُمْ Take it, take some milk to your captive tonight, meaning Abdul Rahman ibn Muljam. لا حول ولا قوة إلا بالله العلي العظيم إنا لله وإنا إليه راجعون وسيعلم الذين ظلموا أي منقلب ينقلب Raise your hands and do'a, brothers and sisters. نسألك اللهم وندعوك باسمك العلي الأعظم على عز الأجل الأكرم يا الله اللهم لا تدع لنا ذنبا إلا غفرته ولا هما إلا فرجته ولا عيبا إلا سترته ولا خوفا إلا آمنت ولا رزقا إلا بسطته ولا شملا إلا جمعته ولا مرضا إلا شفيته ولا غائبا إلا حفظته وأذنيته ولا حاجة من حوائج الدنيا والآخرة لك فيها رضا ولنا فيها صلاح إلا قضيتها ويسرتها يا أرحم الراحمين ولأرواح المؤمنين والمؤمنات نقرأ سورة الفاتحة مع الصلوات <تصفيق>